Hello, I'm Morris Kohansky, Wilderness Living Skills and Survival Instructor, specializing in the boreal forest. Here we have um, uh, a book that's on uh, uh, the uh, e-books through Karamat, Kobo, Amazon. It's uh, a, a compilation of knowledge that was available in a publication. There was a magazine and what didn't end up in bushcraft wasn't really available when the magazine came out of print, so it was organized and put into this document, and we call it the basic safe and uh, safe uh, travel and boreal forest survival handbook, in that it covers about the equivalent of bushcraft on, on stuff that isn't found in bushcraft that readily. There is some uh, rep repetition in the acts, but otherwise, people are anxious to get more literature from me. The, it is available in ebook form and they can wait in great anticipation for more stuff that will come on ebook so you can check your Amazon Cobol and Karamat for this type of information through the ebook process or format. Uh, we are going to uh, cover the issue of fishing as sometimes part of survival. I like to point out that uh, there are many important things before you start to live off the land, but a lot of people feel happier if they know a little bit about that sort of thing. If there's any easy way to get something to eat, it's by fishing, provided you have the gear. Now you can take a postcard and tape all the fishing gear you require uh, onto that postcard and mail it to somebody because it's very light and, and not much substance, but with that you can catch considerable fish. Now basically you have to have a hook and remind you that any hooks today should be barbless if they're to be legal in the province of Alberta and a weight of some sort and remind you that perhaps at the same token the, the lead weights that were commonly available a number of years ago are no longer allowable because lead is considered toxic in the water and so these are ancient museum pieces. Instead of the uh, the barbless hook is solved by removing the hook, generally by squeezing it tightly with the pliers, and it usually breaks off. And we have here some small lures with uh, hooks on them. This tiny little hook that we have here is for the type of fish you're apt to catch in the foothills using the methods I described, which is either the tin can or the long, long pole method. This is a fishing pole here that's as long as possible, and they do have. They have two distinct uh, approaches, and we'll explain them in a moment. Uh, the size of hook, size 10 hook, universally, is one that uh, catches an awful lot of fish, although in some cases you might even go smaller because that's all you have is rather small fish. So size 10 hooks usually catch trout, at least, or grayling this long, whereas uh, the smaller fish that you may catch in great amounts take a smaller hook. Their mouths aren't very big. So you need a hook, you need, might use a leader, and leaders are found readily. Some of them can be quite fine. And then you need a weight. And usually the weight doesn't have to be on the leader. And instead of the lead weights that were kind of cut in half almost and clamped on that, we tend to use uh, nails, shingle nails. And somewhere here, this is what we mean by nails. They do very well as weights. And you might choose to carry different weights, but the shingle nail is perfect for the size 10 hook. And I've used that all my life, and I have always caught fish whenever I wanted to catch them. So you've got the little nail as the weight. The uh, other is at least five pound test monofilament. Uh, this is actually a cable which is quite strong, so I would say in a kit you might want something that is uh, not giving the, the fish as much of a sporting chance as, as uh, you know, we, those poor fish with their small brains and compared to us with our big brains and how we tend to use so much technology. What you need is something maybe nose to fingertip long with the idea that you could tie this to a long pole as the first method of fishing. So I unwind that and I've got 
an elastic holding everything in place, but basically we will go for there we have the almost nose to fingertip. You usually have about nose to fingertip on the end of your pole, and if this is very thin, you have some winding down to a stronger portion of your pole. Because you could catch a fish that could break the tip off your stick. Sometimes it happens that an unusually big fish grabs your lure and gets hooked and off breaks your stick. Here we might attach, uh, there are various ways you can do this usually. The quickest way, at least in my memory, is you make an eye whichever way you can and generally a dependable way of making the eye is just to have a loop and tie an overhand knot. You could use a bowline, you could use a figure of eight, but in the simplicity you, you tie this to create a permanent eye in the end of your line, which now means that it's easy for you to attach your, your various other ends. Now, these hooks have a leader already on them. And let's say we've got a size 10, we could put that on. But instead, we'll go and create a, well, I don't need that for this one here. Um, we take the loop or the leader and the loop and you can attach it because there's the hook with a little bit of leader and then there's a loop on the end so you can engage it in the uh, reef knot mode. Size 10 hooks. Now we're trying to show you uh, the simplicity of the whole issue here. And you take this leader, usually you get about six pieces. You get six, they don't cost very much. There it is, invisible almost. It's got an eye in the end. And you use what I say, the, the reef knot mode, which means you thread this through the big loop, then thread the hook through this loop, and then it's attached. And you can change for different hooks, but you have instantly attached that. And this now is attached with a jam knot to the end of the stick. I guess we should, we can simulate this so that you see the whole description. I mean the amount of knowledge that you need to have or the amount of equipment for fishing is remarkably small. So here we've got the wire and of course the jam nut would call for a knot to make sure it doesn't work its way down and then the slip knot and you put it on the end of your stick and you perhaps use a notch. And if I was doing everything right, this looks substantial to me, I'd make sure that there was something running down the pole to make sure that uh, the tip doesn't break off and you've lost the hook, you've lost the fish, and the fish may not be very, very happy. So there is jam knotted on there, half hitch. And the way you use this is you can fish over shrubbery and on a bank that is kind of awkward with regard to you putting your hook back and forth. So generally you dangle it carefully. And you put some bait on. Well, we will. Sh this hook by itself isn't going to catch anything, so we'll put something on here. Now, the commonest bait is any blossom you can find, or go to the base of a cup parsnip, and you will find three earthworms usually congregated at the base. So earthworms, bees, and if you can catch a horsefly. How do you catch a horsefly? Well, when you lick your arm and there's horseflies about, they are attracted to that shiny nature. And when you moisten it with your saliva, the fly will land there. And if the fly is sitting there, you take four fingers and you aim four fingers at the back end of the fly and you simply go like this and you have the fly in your hand. If you go straight for the fly, it'll back off and fly away. So it's... Uh, a secret that we have. So if the fly was sitting on my watch bracelet, I would calculate it's there, I would go like that and I've got the fly. And then you stick it very carefully on the back end of the fly so it flies with your hook. That must be illegal because there's no fish can resist that type of lure, active lure. Now I'm saying that you use the pole because you can now reach over the shrubbery 
you've only got four feet uh, or less of monofilament. You've got the lightest pole possible and you can reach over to where you see eddy lines and the longer the pole. Now sometimes we even attach another pole onto a pole and we attach a rock at this end because it's kind of awkward using your fishing pole like this where it's less awkward to be using your fishing pole with a counterweight on the back or longer. And then you see the place where you think the fish are and as you uh, settle down and you're quiet, you keep bringing it closer to the water till it lightly, lightly, lightly touches the water. And if there's fish, pretty soon you see activity. If there's little fish, they'll come and they'll start leaping out after your bait. And they're too little for you to catch, but they tear off your bait. So you dangle and let them leap, leap, and then they stop leaping. That means the big fish is coming because the big fish has been attracted by all that activity. Then you go and you maybe even drop it uh, into the water and that nail that you got on the end causes the hook to go maybe uh, uh, um, you know, uh, 10 centimeters into the water and there all of a sudden you've got the biggest fish that happens to be in the area that noticed all the little fish leaping for the and then you swing it over carefully onto shore. You're reaching over shrubbery and you're getting over there and you're catching your fish and you lift everything off. Casting, you're gonna have the hook always catching on the shrubbery so we don't cast generally. But where you cast, you prefer, because these poles that we, long beautiful poles are not easy to come by. Instead, you make yourself a kind of a fishing arrangement where you take a short stick and you affix it inside the can to be able to hook the can with your fingers and you end up having a, a, a system where you cast. And your shingle nails that you brought are of course uh, handy in uh, uh, keeping that handle in place or you might find some way of lashing that handle in place. Your, your skookum knife should be up to, be up to being used as a hammer. and you nail that in place. Leave the nail out a little bit for attaching your, your um, fish line on one side anyway. Now I had a situation where uh, we used both methods. Where the shrubbery isn't a problem, you don't need the long pole. And where the shrubbery is a problem, essentially when you're competing with someone on an equal basis, you catch the same number of fish with with both ways. Now I'm gonna take some string and I will use some string here so it's more visible. You take your fish lure, take your tape up your hook, you put it on here and you use maybe 10 arm spans of string and it's wound on here, wound up and wound right up till it's more or less used. You got enough here to throw and you're holding everything in place with your thumb and as you throw this, you let go of it, it unreels as if it's a reel. And then you pull it in. But as you pull it in, if there's shrubbery to be hooked, you're gonna hook it. So one, two, oh, we have the line here on this ancient can where I've got hooks all ready to go and so on. This was my, my um, um, kit that I put together years and years ago. And it was one of those things that I but I figured um, everybody needed to put together 40 items packed in the mustard tin kit. The jam knot. So the pre-measured amount. I just put a little weight on here for simulation. Kids will play with such a thing but without the hooks for hours sometimes mastering the business of casting. Now I would say this has served me well in the issue of survival training 
You don't want this to be too heavy because your lures are likely quite light. But I sure have caught my fair share of fish this way. Half hitch. Attach everything the way we did with the long pole. Here we got here we've got the reel. Here we have it wound up. Here we keep everything in place. And then you learn by casting by Oops. Oh, the reason that I failed there is I didn't hammer that nail in after. You needed a nail to attach, and that nail hooked my, <laughs> hooked my string. And there's still a thread of string. Right. You use a pop can, you could carve a piece of wood this way. And of course, a little practice is going to be required for you to learn to cast. Uh, and I'm out of practice, so. There, I've got the hang of it. Learn this from the Swedes. Because most of my life I used the long pole until I met some of the Swedish survival instructors. One other approach is to have net. There's some, this is from a survival kit packed for the United, for the um, Canadian military survival situation. Keeping in mind you have to have a permit to set nets, but in survival they used to include these in the kits as they're big on living off the land. And you got to remember that when you set these up you got to be often in the water with the net and it's easy to get entangled in the survival. The weights and the fish net and everything were all in one package. And actually I don't know how many people in Canada have had the privilege to be able to acquire one of these fish nets that was specifically designed for the RCAF survival kit. Fishing, keep in mind, fish don't have many calories. You'll use up way more energy uh, trying to catch the fish as you get in eating it. However, there are people that feel happier about having something to do and uh, the business of fishing can be quite um, um, satisfying. There are other devices, which I do not know how legal they are, but this particular device is found in Swedish sources. And um, I think all you have to do is, is uh, bump the animal on this and this vicious device, which could really, uh, what do you call it? maim a human. There's a, a string there. We've got, and it hangs by this thread there. I, my Swedish friends all seem to bring these because I don't think they're available generally. But anyway, there it is. It's hanging like that. And I guess there must be bait somewhere because as you do the, this, do I know about how crude that is, but it really grabs onto things that that uh, disturb it. There's also something similar that's found in all the kits, military kits, that um, sets the hook. So this is dangling and the fish disturbs it and the hook is set. <coughs> I generally have never used these, but they seem to be kind of popular in many kits. <coughs> There's a spring that does essentially something similar and, and it's set up so that uh, when the fish disturbs the hook, the arms spread apart, setting the hook so that the fish is, is uh, it's not a question of the slightest nibble will often catch the fish. <clears throat> Whereas without that, nibbles and fish will realize it's not something edible and they leave. But anyway, I've enjoyed fishing a great deal. Um, adds a little bit of spice, gives you something to do. And there are circumstances where it may make uh, the situation more bearable when you can catch all the fish you can eat, which is readily done in the foothills in our trout streams where you catch grayling and the various forms of trout. <coughs>